back here with Little Miss Funeral or Lauren, and we are going to answer 10 more of your videos today. So we're going to kind of go back and forth this time, and Lauren's going to start it off by asking the first of our 10 questions. Okay, so Paul asked, as you've been in the business a little longer than your counterpart, let's get both of your views on the major changes in the industry since you've been in it and where you see the industry going in the future. Now, how many years have you been in, Lauren? How many years have you been in? Uh, eight years. This is my eighth year in the business. Okay, and I'm at 16 license. So we've got a lot of uh, knowledge going into this between the two of us, which is awesome. I think the business, you know, everybody talks about the cremation effect. And I think that that aside, right now we're seeing this huge conflict. I was actually talking to somebody about it today between the old school and the new school and it's almost like there's no middle road we have kind of the black suit white shirt very traditional funeral directors and then we have the new groups coming in that are a little more liberal i guess you could say a little more relaxed they don't all wear always wear suits you've got more tattoos maybe more piercings so it's just this I think we've got this conflict right now where they're not meshing as well because this group is sticking, you know, firm with what they believe and this group comes in believing they know everything or not wanting to mesh. And so I think we're, we're, we've got a little, a little battle going on right now with that. I see down the road in about 10 years, that's going to weed itself out because that generation is going to have retired and will then be into a little more, um, liberal but not crazy liberal uh, group group of funeral directors where they're more open to new ideas open to what the baby boomers are all wanting so that is where i see the changes not so much with the cremation stuff but with the staffing and directors themselves is where i see the biggest change so yeah and i'm itchy i'm sorry. <laughs> right now. but um yeah no, I agree with you with that whole thing like I mean I know I've only been in it for eight years or whatnot but in the short time that I've been in the industry I've seen um obviously like every single year like you were saying cremation you know the funeral home does a little bit more cremation and a little right. less burial or entombment or whatnot um but I think that the funeral from what I have seen has become much more casual yeah. just we're saying, you know, people maybe aren't always dressing up in suits. We're not always laying people out in suits, you know, we're laying people out in sports jerseys or different things to make them more celebrations of life. So I think that that is a change that I've just seen, just getting away from that religious aspect of this is how grandma and grandpa always did things and getting more into we want to celebrate this person and make it personal as to how they live their life. Agreed. Yeah. Well, if a person was in a horrible accident that an open casket couldn't happen, would this family still be able to view their loved one privately before the funeral or is it highly discouraged, not allowed? Okay. So I suppose the first question would be how bad of an accident, what has happened? Like, is it, are we looking at just broken bones and not a lot of physical trauma to their face? Or are we looking at something? Let's go with like full on decapitation, half the head's gone, yeah. horrible, horrible, I guess. Let's go big. So if that's what we're going off of, then as a funeral director, I, and this might sound horrible and I don't mean it to sound horrible, but if it was something like that, I really would discourage a person from viewing their loved one without, unless they would give us opportunity to do some sort of restorative work. Um, I would, I am such an advocate for having people view their loved one and having people spend time with their deceased that I hate to even say that. But at the end of the day, there does come a point where a person has been in some sort of an accident where viewing them that way would put more trauma on top of the family to do that than to just remember them as is. Right. I'd want to do whatever I could to prepare them if I had their permission to and to do everything to restore them to what they were beforehand, but that's not always a possibility. So right. if it wasn't a possibility, I think since we do see a lot of that stuff, we would just say, listen, in this situation, you might be better off just to remember them as is because it would add additional trauma to view them like that. I think it's always good to point out, like legally, 
someone cannot be stopped from seeing their loved one. Yeah. That can never happen. So I always like to say that because people kind of keep throwing that at me on the YouTube channel and stuff. And I like to put it out that that's legally you have the right. Yeah. Um, and like you said, I always encourage viewing of some kind. I have wrapped a head so they could see hands, you know, covering up the extreme trauma so they can at least have some viewability to see a part of the person, um, which I always, you know, go for something, even if it's a foot or something. I've done it too. Yeah, which is great. I feel like I have, like with this window, there's a window next to me and I feel like I'm like, it's like, go towards the light, Karen. <laughs> okay. It's so Catherine asks, I would love to hear your opinion of what a funeral attendant's job description is. Okay. So funeral attendant, I think there's a lot of areas that this job title maybe gets given to whether it is a funeral attendant. So the door swinger or the parking lot attendant, um, I am not one for job descriptions. I have been kind of trained and gone through my career that job description is a really crappy word because just because funeral director might be my job title, it doesn't mean I'm not gonna wash the toilet or I'm not going to shovel the snow or I'm not going to you know, clean cobwebs or scrape off old wallpaper. Like you, your job description could be really anything to better the business that you're working for. So I think that when it comes to a funeral attendant, greeting people when they come for visitations, cleaning up after the visitation, emptying trash, setting up chairs, moving flowers, um, taking coats if the funeral home you work for takes coats, um, parking the cars, washing the cars, you know, whatever, I guess, falls into that within your funeral home that you're working for. Cause I think it will be different for every funeral home because sometimes they have more job categories than others. Um, yeah. For sure. You know, sometimes removal staff is also the same as does funeral attendant work. So it's, there's a lot of crossover depending on how big your, your funeral home is. Yeah. I was just going to say that I think it depends on the funeral home that you work for and the size of their staff. Um, for instance, the funeral home where I'm currently employed, we have two funeral directors and one full-time funeral associate. Um, so for us, we have a very small operation where we basically, we do everything because we not many people to do yeah. it all. So a funeral associate would, in my mind, be somebody to assist a funeral director in whatever they may need. And like you were saying, a funeral director doesn't mean we're just sitting in our office looking pretty, like we're yeah. doing things and that person's going to help us to accomplish those tasks. Agreed. Jalen wonders about funeral veils and if they are used once and buried with the person. Okay. Um, so this question, is this regarding like the funeral veil? Like the veil that goes over the casket. Have you ever seen one? I don't think so. So, um, I have never actually used Oh, one. No. we're going like way back, aren't we? Like, we're talking old school. Oh. Yes. yes, yes. So, I'll let you answer and then I'll interject something I just learned recently. So. No, so honestly, I have never used a funeral veil like over a casket. Yeah. Um, even though we're a traditional funeral home, we have never had a request for that. And honestly, I don't even think we have one in stock where we could use one if somebody had requested. I'd have to go on eBay and like buy one. <laughs> I found them like when cleaning out a funeral home, like an old funeral home where it's just stuffed back in the cupboard. And I was like, what is this maroon lacy thing? And so quick description for viewers, a funeral veil is literally, sometimes it's lacy, but it's like a mesh thing that you lay over the lid of the casket down over the body to the front and it's used often to protect when you have restorative work and you don't want people touching the body because there's maybe wax and so forth and so that was used as kind of just a buffer to keep people away but I had somebody tell me recently that their funeral home uses one on every single body and I was like is it aerial wise and it was somewhere I want to say it was Louisiana or somewhere down Missouri I don't know somewhere down south and I was like I, I've never heard or seen a funeral home use one so yeah. it was yeah obviously by your action which is hilarious <laughs> You're like, what? Yeah. <laughs> okay because when I was looking at this question I was thinking like are they talking about those stylish hats that oh, like <laughs> <laughs> the veil down front when you're wearing one 
<laughs> yeah, because like I would totally wear one of those, but that's what I was thinking of at first. So here, I'm sorry, I'm a funeral director that had no idea no, what a funeral. Love it. Was. Well, and when they are used, Jalen, they are not buried with the person. They're reused over and over and over, and you may have one or two different colors depending. But um, as you, as from our response, we have not been in places that really use them. What do you do with so, troublesome uh, family dynamics when emotions are running so high? Do you engage the family yourself or do you have to summon the police? I feel like this could be a whole video all on its own. I have actually am discussing this in my student group on Facebook right now, like when arrangements get heated and then next week we're talking about what happens when fights break out. Um, if it is a general small conflict, I will kind of talk things out if it's like during arrangements and so forth. I try and let families play it out as long as it's not interfering with the funeral itself or with a visitation and it's not causing a huge disturbance and it's maybe on the side or in the parking lot, I kind of let it be. If it's to the point where people are threatening or it looks like it's getting to that point, then I will just call the police. You know, that's what their job is to come and, you know, break up that kind of stuff. And it, putting a police presence there for a few minutes gets people kind of straightened up quicker than you know carry the funeral director coming out and go hey you boys or you girls or whoever um i think the last funeral i had one at was was women that were like bat, like fighting i was like who are they gonna throw down <laughs> you know why that kind of makes the day a little exciting but um i have called the police a few times i've called police because people were so drunk that they were passed out and on the sidewalk and you know we didn't know what to do with them so and nobody wanted to help them. So it's, you know, it, um, you kind of, each situation is so unique that yeah. you, you have to kind of deal with it as it goes. And mo I always say most people get along until the person is in the ground. I found that as soon as the funeral is done, that is when like all hell breaks loose and people go to town fighting each other for money or whatever it is that they were holding together by usually I hear later like oh you should have seen what happened at the luncheon because it's like they hold it together and then phew, just yeah. let her go yeah but I don't know what you find um well like you were saying I think funerals bring out the best in people and the worst in people and we always hope for the best in everybody and I think a lot of times families will put aside their differences to at least get the arrangement conference and things going on like that. Um, I have had to call the police a couple of times and one time was when I was just licensed. I mean I think I was 21 years old and it was in the middle of a funeral service at the funeral home and somebody was up saying a eulogy. And in the back of the room a family member got up and started swearing. Uh -huh. and at them and then they started running up to like actually go fight them and I was standing at the door and I, I froze I was just kind of like because number one I couldn't understand like that I was actually seeing this yeah two I'm not the largest of ladies so like here I am thinking how what what am I gonna do and thankfully I had another more seasoned funeral director with me so he kind of went in the middle of them and said, go and just call the police. And I did. And it's an unfortunate thing that happens. Like you said, it always keeps things interesting, but it's an right. other reality to high emotions during funerals. Well, for sure. And families have every dynamic, which is great about this business because we get to see and encounter everything, but that means everything, the good, the bad, the ugly. And at the end of the day, I always make sure that the body is safe and yeah you know, that there's nothing interfering with people and kind of how things are playing out because the funeral is happening once essentially. And so, you know, if we can keep it moving without too much craziness or I, I did have once like an ex-wife showed up, tried to claim that the woman had poisoned the husband. And then when she found out he had been cremated, it was like, I, it was crazy. That was a police moment where they were like attacking each other because they were claiming things. And it was like, yeah what the heck? And then they were blaming me because I had cremated the body and I was part of the conspiracy. I was like, I really don't care enough to be part of a conspiracy to cremate a, you know, 90 year old man that you think was poisoned, but yeah. it was crazy. No, the body loses heat faster than it can produce heat, causing a dangerously low blood temperature. So like, yeah, cold. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, I'm
Oh, and you the thing is when you go in cold water and then you come out and you have to strip down and be warm next to somebody else's well, body. So I think if you're in water, that could be a form of hypothermia because, y you know, like, I think right. of like Jack in the Titanic, you know, he had hypothermia. <laughs> <laughs> is that a bad example? <laughs> exactly. So like I you were like, Oh, and I should not be laughing at this right now, but that's no. what I, that's what I think of. I, uh, think living in Buffalo, I would have more experience with people dying of hypothermia. Um, but thankfully I haven't. No. Yeah. I've, I've only had that one woman and you know, she just died sitting out in the cold cause she didn't know cognizantly better to go to the neighbor's house that was 10 feet away. That's so and she was she was in the garage because my first question was, why didn't anybody see her? But she was in literally inside her garage and it was so cold that she died inside her garage of that, um, with her dog and her dog was still living. He didn't die, but yeah. Um, she's, I think the only one, and I don't know what the process is like, you know, you hear it's like pins and needles as your body, you know, kind of gets cold and your nerves start freezing and, and things, but I, I, not having experienced it, I really can't say, I guess. Oh, yeah, I think yes. it's, uh, so Megan asks, how do you open a mausoleum, or how, how to open a mausoleum? I take this as to how to physically open a mausoleum yeah. and not open one to start one. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I'm taking it as how do you open it when you want to maybe get a body out or something. Correct. That's um, how I So if you watch my mausoleum video, there is a... Uh, big concrete plate that's put up and it is caulked in and then there's little brackets put in around it so when you want to open it you take crowbars and bust hammer them in through the caulk and you have to just break out that piece and sometimes it'll come as a whole piece so that you can put it back in if you need to but sometimes it destroys it and you have to get a new concrete piece to put in so it's actually not too difficult of a process it looks like i mean obviously i've never done it but um it doesn't look like it's too hard to you know pop off that that piece that's uh caulked in there so yeah and that piece is typically um at least in my area under like the nice granite marble yeah piece so when you go into a mausoleum you're going to see that granite or stone with the name and the date and on that and typically those like in the corners will have almost like um little screws that yeah. they will like the, medallions almost yeah. with screws yeah They'll have like a fancy screwdriver that's not a fancy screwdriver it just opens up you know those particular brackets yeah. and um as soon as you take that piece off then it's everything like Carrie was saying. Yeah. Have you ever caught anything from a body sickness wise? So I have not. Um, I am huge with PPE, the personal protective equipment. I have some old school funeral directors who will even to this day, like make fun of me because I really very rarely touch a dead body uh, without gloves. I mean, like if it's getting ready for a visitation and I'm doing some touch up on makeup or cosmetics or things like that, you know, I'm not wearing gloves in those situations. But if I'm moving a person or doing any sort of preparation work, I always have gloves and a mask and everything that you should have on. Um, but it is fairly easy to catch certain, you know, illnesses right. from so you really do have to be careful in those situations yeah and I don't know if like cold flu like you know if I've caught that from somebody it's I don't I don't know if it's from a body you know because it can linger so long it can germinate for two weeks or whatever so who knows if it was from a body or if it was from living people some of that yeah. stuff it's too hard to trace back I think but yeah. I went to a wake recently, Carolyn says, for a 14-year-old boy that had passed from a heart attack. I was expecting him to look simply asleep, but rather he looked very dead, sunken in cheeks, pale face, and darkening around the edges of the face. Can you explain why this might have been? Also, can you talk about seeing a dead body for the first time and how they may look? Okay, so... For this 14 year old boy, um, that's a really sad situation, first of all, for him of having died of a heart attack. Um, but for me, just hearing that, it makes me think that there was something else going on um, in order for him to suffer from that heart attack, which could have made him look very ill, sunken in cheeks and, and things like that. I mean, a normal 
healthy 14 year old kid is not going to just pass away from a heart attack. There has to be something else underlying whether or not it's like, you know, a weakened heart or something's just not right. So he could have been Ill. like, was he ill for a long time? Do we know? Do we have any yeah, of that? Did he have the flu? Did he? Cause yeah. that's often a huge trigger for if they have a heart condition they don't know about, they get the flu and that is enough to push the heart condition into a heart attack. So I, yeah, I don't know. That's all she gave us. So so that's what I would think. I would think that for him, you know, it had to have been something where he was sick before he had that heart attack that caused him to look that way. And my thought with that too was he probably had an autopsy, my mm -hmm. guess. And oftentimes um, with autopsies, because the person's in a cooler, it depends how long they're in a the cooler and they may get dark. Um, their skin gets darker, or kind of like a gray color. And sometimes that doesn't go away and it sounds like they didn't maybe cosmetize a lot just because of if he was very pale so there was maybe just some light restorative work that they could have done but it, you know without being there and seeing it's hard to criticize somebody else's work um because we just don't know and you don't know what the starting point was for them no. either he could have looked amazing for what you know they had started had yeah so so do you um, remember the first body you saw? I do. Oh, I have been seeing dead bodies for so long yeah. um, because I grew up with a funeral home like in my family. My, my great aunt and my great uncle had a funeral home and they lived in the funeral home. Okay. So I would be a little girl going over to see them and my aunt would take me into the visitation room and I would always ask, I'd be like four years old and she would take me in there and I would go see who she had laid out that day. So I've been seeing um, like laid out bodies ever since I was a little girl. The very first dead body that I ever saw was right before I went away to mortuary school. I was accepted to mortuary school, but I was very nervous about the embalming process because by nature, I am actually a very queasy person. <laughs> like I always say, I could never be a nurse. I could never be a doctor. Like if somebody gets a paper cut, I'm like, you got to get away from me. And there is in my mind, a huge difference between live and dead blood. Don't ask, but in my mind, there's a huge difference. <laughs> so when I, right before I went away to mortuary school, um, I actually had a friend of the family who was a funeral director, um, and he took me to, to witness him do an embalming just to make certain I wasn't going to be going to school and then not be able to stomach it and then drop out. Um, that actually happened to my dad. So he went to mortuary school. He couldn't finish. Um, and it's a different experience, I think seeing an actual dead body in front of you. I think as a culture, we are so used to seeing somebody made up with their hair done in a suit or in a nice dress, like just lying there. And when you view just somebody who has passed away, no makeup, maybe their eyes are open, their mouth is open, it just kind of takes you aback a little bit, I think, because we're just not used to seeing a person in that state. Yeah. Um, so that was the first time I had ever viewed anybody. And it wasn't that it was scary. It was just that it was different for me. Yeah. Um, and like anything, the more you see something, the more you, uh, you know, have that in your life, you just get used to it. So like anything, I've just gotten used to it over the years. Yeah. That's, I, I, I couldn't recall a first time if you wanted me to. I mean, my grandpa died when I was three, but. And I remember being at the funeral home, but you know, I don't recall later in life just because I've been around bodies, like you said, so long. It's just so commonplace. It's like um, Wesley asks, okay. "How is an extremely large person, five hundred plus, uh, five hundred plus pounds, handled when they pass away at a location other than a hospital? How is the cremation performed and everything involved in the cremation process?" How is the burial handled and everything involved in that process? So this question, in preparing for it, um, I know Lauren and I have both handled several individuals who have been uh, over 500 or around 500 pounds. 
but um, I wanted to kind of pull a little more in terms of what people have encountered and what they've done within the business because my obesity video is the one that is like, it has created the most um, response, either positive or flaming negative, like horrible things. And it's a really a hot trigger point. And so I wanted to just ask a lot of funeral directors. So I did. And um, a lot of them, when the death was outside the hospital, a lot of, the first thing is a lot of people. It takes a lot of people to move somebody that large. We're talking at least six, more like 10 to 12, um, because, you know, it's a bad term, but dead weight, when somebody is not able to help you with their movement, even just putting their arm where you want it or moving their leg where you want it, moving somebody in that capacity is very hard. And the fascia or the, you know, the, the fat just, it, it moves differently than another body would because if you turn somebody that large, if their stomach is the area that's large, it creates a fulcrum point that throws the whole body off then to one side. And so moving them is extremely hard to do. So a lot of fire people using fire departments and first responders, EMTs, you know, they kind of call their local people. Um, and I know that I've heard a lot of from fire departments that, you know, we don't get paid for that you know, funeral homes or EMTs and things, but fire departments, if they're voluntary, don't get paid to come in on a call like that. Um, so some of the funeral directors have said, you know, we'll bring over breakfast the next day to them, or we'll make sure we try and um, pay them, or they've set something up with them to allow, because, it, you know, it used to be maybe one call a year. Now it is sometimes several calls a year, or some funeral homes, if they're a large volume, do three, four calls like this a month where they're handling extremely large people. And it's, you know, we try and go in the most professional way and do everything we can to respect them and the family, because the families are the ones that are there to see, you know, the people in the community who are out trying to eyeball and, and see what's going on because they know it's going to not be a normal thing. But, um, so we use any means we can, lots of labor, uh, cremation facilities. So there are cremation facilities that are built for larger individuals. You may have to drive several hours to get to one. I was speaking with a woman in Kentucky who has one that's built for up to a thousand pounds individuals. And she has not run into anybody that she's had to turn away yet. Um, I've had people asking me, do you just member bodies to put them in there? And I'm like, no, you would, we would never cut apart a human body to make them fit in a casket in a, mm -hmm. anything like that's horrible so that does not happen so someone shared the story though um they had an individual that multiple funeral homes had turned down handling the care for this this man and so this funeral home finally accepted the call and they had to use a flatbed truck to move him you can't put him in the back of a a standard vehicle because of the suspension and the weight. Um, so they used a flatbed truck and covered him up and, and brought him to the funeral home. They put up tents so they could give privacy to bringing him into the funeral home to care for him. Uh, the vault is essentially a septic tank. It's a large, just concrete box unit, larger caskets, um, and a heck of a lot of staff because you can't just pick the people the person up with a lift when they're to a certain size. So I think staff and, and everything is one um, big thing is having enough people and, you know, small staff like your staff, Lauren, is who are you going to call? You know, yeah. you have to call your local people. Um, so where, what, what I've talked to some people about with this is, you know, it's going to get to the point because of the obesity epidemic we have, we're going to need in larger cities or in areas where one funeral home maybe gets equipped to handle individuals over a certain size. Um, and there was a man from New Zealand who has actually done that. He went and invested in all of the equipment, which is thousands and thousands of dollars worth of equipment for the cot and the lift and everything you would need. And so anybody from anywhere around that has an individual like that, they bring them to his location and he cares for them. 
Um, I thought it was interesting he did that because I think that's where it's going to have to go because small funeral homes can't invest $50,000 in equipment for calls that they only do sometimes five, 10 times a year, but that equipment is needed or else you can't care for those individuals. So there's kind of this, you know, give and take, do we take the call even though we can't handle the person properly or do we, um, you know, send them somewhere else? Do we, what do we do? Um, you know, like one gentleman said, my firm is small and I'm not going to even buy a cot that can handle larger than 500 pounds because that's what we have. We're not going to invest in the larger 1,000 pound cot that we don't need but one time a year or two times yeah. a year. So now what are you seeing? Anything beyond that or any thoughts on all of it? Well, I think an important thing to say, like, like you were saying at the beginning too, it's not like this topic is in no way, shape or form, like fat shaming. Do you know what I mean? This is literally just a, this is how our world is. And there are people who are small and there are people who are larger. And that's just the fact of the matter. And like you were saying, if somebody is going to be a larger person, then um, like the couple of examples that I've had, we had a gentleman who was about 600 pounds, I think he was, who died on the second floor of his home. And he was living on that second floor and his family was taking care of him for so long because he was so large that he couldn't get up and, and do things. And we called in the fire department and had tarps and were, were able to get him you know, into the care of the funeral home. And the thing is the family knew that, the family knew his size. You know, If you say something like your loved one is extremely large, it's not like that's a shock. It's not like right. you're telling them something that they don't know. Um, it's just our job as funeral professionals to be as respectful as we can of that person while still having to do our job. And when we have somebody who is extremely obese, we have to do our job so differently. Mm -hmm. um, just in order, like you said, to have the equipment and to have the personnel and to just have that power behind us being able to serve these families. Yeah. And I think that it's important for people out there to realize too that if you're ever in a situation where a funeral home turns you down because of the size of a person, it's not that they are turning you away because of that. It could just be, like you said, they don't have the tools in order to properly serve you. And it wouldn't be fair on anybody's end to accept that call. It's not fair for the funeral home if they're not going to be able to show the respect and dignity to yeah. this person that they deserve when they pass away and it's not fair to the family to you know not have their loved one receive that care so like you were saying I think that there are funeral homes out there that times are changing people are getting larger in the world that we live in so eventually funeral homes you know will have more equipment than they need but in the times that we're dealing with today it's not that you ever want to turn a family away but sometimes you just you can't properly serve them well i think that goes with um you know other areas you know how do we deal with people with extremely contagious diseases how do we deal with you know certain things and people are turned away if they have certain diseases because funeral homes are not comfortable or equipped to care for them. So I think it's kind of the same thing. And it's not that we're disease shamers. It's yeah. people want to know how we handle things. And, you know, in order to explain them, we have to, we're telling the truth. You know, we are trying to give, um, you know, shine light on what we do. And that's just kind of a fact. One of the funeral directors actually brought up a really valid point. He said, not so much even caring for the person, but as a business owner caring for our staffs, looking at our liabilities, mm -hmm. our workman's comp, every staff member we take on those calls is going to be lifting more than they typically would in conditions they're not typically under. So it's more of a, you know, consequent or not consequent, more of a, um, what is that word? More of a, <laughs> okay, it's more of a likelihood that yeah their staff might get injured like their back or their leg or whatever during that um, time when they're bringing them into their care. And so that is also something that, you know, we have to look at as we go forward that if workman's comps increase because of some of this, then there's going to be 
you know, business owner wise, there's going to have to be a change as well. Um, and I had never thought about that until that man said it yesterday because, you know, I'm not a business owner of a funeral home. And so I never, I guess, would think about that, but it's a very valid, um, valid point. So yeah. end of the day, you know, as funeral directors, we have families and we have lives. And even though being a funeral director is so much more than a job, you know, at the end of the day, we also have to care for ourselves. If we don't take care of ourselves, we cannot help families. Exactly. And nobody wins, you know, so. Exactly. No, that's, that's excellent point. So, well, cool. Well, this wraps up our episode two of 10 questions with Little Miss Funeral and Carrie. I swear. <laughs> I need more to my name. I don't think <laughs> Carrie. We'll make you little, we can have, even though I'm a Mrs., we'll make you like little Mrs. Funeral. Okay. That's, that's true. It's like the bride made. I was a Miss before I was, um, I was a Miss before I was a Mrs. with the whole funeral thing. So, <laughs> funeral director longer than I've been married. There. That's a better way to put that. <laughs> longer commitment than the marriage. At yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thank you for joining me again. And everybody, as always, please subscribe to both of our channels. Make sure you like the video, share the video, ask us more questions. We have two more videos planned at this point, and we are always wanting to add more to it. We love answering questions and educating people. So make sure you subscribe and check in. Bye, guys. Bye.